This video is going to explain the operation of the early Ford gauges. Shown is a 1966 Mustang instrument cluster of the five dial type. Also the four gauge instrument panel of a 1964 through 1966 Thunderbird. Even though the physical construction and mounting of the gauges is different, they all have the same internal workings. This will be true for other Ford vehicles as well. There are three types of gauges used in these clusters. There is amp meter the operation will be explained later, the speedometer which is strictly a mechanical device. And then we have the fuel, oil and temperature gauges which all operate in the same manner and will be covered first. Falcons and 1965 Mustangs only had the fuel and temperature gauges. In place of the oil gauge there is a oil warning light. There was a generator or alternator warning light in place of the amp meter. The exception for the 1965 Mustang was the models like the GT which had the pony interior that also have the five dial cluster. Other Ford, Mercury and Lincoln vehicles use the same technology for their gauges even though the face plates and pointers may be different. Slide 2 this slide shows the internal components of the fuel, oil and temperature gauges. These gauges respond to an electrical current which heats up a bi-metallic strip. As the bi-metallic strip heats up, it will bend causing the pointer attached to it to move. Figure 1 shows the position of the pointer with no current flow through the heater. With the ignition key in the off position. Notice the coiled heater wire which is probably tungsten, like used in a light bulb. In testing I found it only takes about a quarter of an amp to drive the pointer to 100% or full scale. The other figures show the pointer in other positions. Slide 3. This slide shows the simplified wiring diagram for the fuel, oil and temperature gauges. Notice the 12 volt power is supplied through a constant voltage regulator. I will explain its operation first. Slide 4. Figure 1 shows the internal construction of the constant voltage regulator. Notice there is a heating coil like the ones in the gauges which when heated will cause the bimetallic arm to bend. When it bends it will open the contacts as shown in figure 3. Notice when the contacts open up the heating coil will lose power as well as the output terminal. This will cause the bimetallic arm to cool down, relaxing the arm which closes the contacts once more. The closing and opening of the contacts will provide a pulsing 12 volts as shown in figure 4. The frequency is approximately a 50% duty cycle providing an average of approximately 5 volts as far as the gauge's operation is concerned. But the output is actually a series of 12 volt pulses. You may say, wait. Why wouldn't it be an average of 6 volts? Because the pulsing DC acts somewhat like AC there is a delay in the rise of the 12 volts as shown by the light lines in Figra 4. Many people have replaced the inner components of the constant voltage regulator with a 5 volt regulator. LM7805. The constant voltage regulator is a difficult device to troubleshoot. The output voltage cannot be measured with a digital voltmeter because the pulses operate so fast the meter cannot resolve the average. The readout will just jump around. An analog voltmeter will be a better choice for measuring the output voltage, although it may not measure exactly 5 volts. Also a incandescent trouble light can be used and it should glow at half brightness. Slide 5. Back to the slide showing the simplified wiring for the fuel, oil and temperature gauges. Notice the sending units are a variable resistor providing a current path to the ground. All of the sending units operate between approximately 10 ohms when the gauge is to be at 100% and 75 ohms when the gauge is to be at 0%. If you think this seems backwards, remember the more current the further the bimetallic strip will bend and move the pointer toward 100%.
Since it takes a lower resistance to increase the current the lower resistance in ohms will move the pointer higher, and higher resistance in ohms will reduce the current and move the pointer lower. Each sender is calibrated to provide the range corresponding to the gauge. For example, the fuel sending unit is calibrated to match the tank shape. Since the fuel sending unit is actuated by a float, the quantity of fuel gallons per inch will vary with different shape tanks. The Falcon and Mustang's tanks have a rather shallow depth compared to a Thunderbird tank. So the Mustang sending unit will have more gallons per inch rise of the float than the Thunderbird sending unit. Also notice the rear of the tank is sloped, so as the level of fuel goes down, the gallons per inch decrease. Also the stock Mustang tank capacity is 14 gallons and the Thunderbird is 20 gallons. So you can see why the sending units need to be calibrated to the tank. When Mustang owners change their fuel tanks to the larger 16-gallon tanks, the fuel gauge won't act the same as it did with the original tank and sending unit unless the sending unit is also changed. I changed out my tank in my 1964 Falcon as well as the gauges. I wanted to use a 1966 Mustang bezel with some LED backlit gauges. The gauges I wanted to use were not available with the Ford 75-10 ohm profile as they were designed to be used with GM vehicles. So I used a microprocessor to convert the signal to the fuel gauge. To do that I needed to know the ohms of the sending unit for each gallon of fuel in the tank. The graph on the right shows the measurements I took after adding a gallon at a time. Notice the ohms per gallon changes the most during the last half of the tank with smaller increments in the first half. This will provide the greatest accuracy for the lower half of the tank, with the thinking it is more important to have more accurate readings near empty than full. Also if I had used a 20 or 22 gallon tank the gauge would stay at the full mark longer until the tank went down below 16 gallons. In case you wondered why some vehicles seem to have a 2 or 3 gallon filler neck, now you know. Again, the oil and temperature sending units are calibrated to match the ohms required to make the measurements match the gauge. Trouble shooting notes. If all of the fuel, oil and temperature gauges are not working the most probable cause is going to be the constant voltage regulator. I would just replace it if no gauges are working. If a single gauge is not working, it is likely the sending unit. To check this you can disconnect the wire from the sender and jumper it to ground. If the gauge is now working, the sending unit is bad and should be replaced. But before replacement, reconnect the sending unit and double check the gauge as it may have been a corroded connection. If the gauge still does not work with the connector grounded, then there is going to be a problem with the wire from the gauge to the sending unit. This may be the result of corrosion in the bulkhead connectors in the firewall. Most Ford vehicles locate them near the driver's side hood hinge. Slide 6. Now we move on to the ammeter. There are two types of ammeters used by Ford. The internal shunt type and the external shunt type. For the way an ammeter works refer to the external shunt diagram first. Notice there is a magnet rod inside the coil that is connected to the pointer. With no current through the coil, the magnetic rod and pointer would be centered. When a current is introduced through the coil a magnetic field occurs around the coil pulling the magnetic rod one direction. When the flow through the coil reverses, the magnetic rod will be pulled the opposite direction. The amount of current in amps will determine the distance the magnetic rod will be pulled. The higher the amps the further the magnetic rod will travel. Now some meters will have the load current running through the coil, but since there is a limit on how big the wire for the coil can be. In small case M meters, a shunt is employed. A shunt is a resistor which has a small resistance in terms of ohms, but a large wire size to accommodate large current flow. 
In fact a shunt can be a length of large gauge wire. This will allow a small voltage drop across the shunt. When the coil in the M meter is connected to each end of the shunt, it will cause a small current through the coil. By measuring the voltage drop across the shunt, large electrical current can be measured with a small case M meter. With the internal shunt type M meter, the shunt is located in the case of the M meter. Ford after about 1964 or 1965 realized the internal shunt type M meters presented a fire hazard when high electrical currents were sent through the ammeter. The hazard was from two sources. The firewall bulkhead connectors and the terminals on the M meter itself. If the connections were to be corroded or loose, the electrical current could cause the connections to heat up, perhaps to the point of melting the case or bulkhead connector. There has been more than one report of fires due to the ammeter by 1964 Thunderbird owners. The 1964 Thunderbird has an internal shunt type ammeter. Starting in 1965 the external shunt type ammeters are used. The shunt for the Ford external shunt type M meters is actually a wire that runs from the alternator to the starter relay. Figure 4 is an excerpt of the Ford ignition, starting and charging GT only diagram. Notice the wire that is used for the shunt. Refer to the wiring diagrams for your particular model to locate the shunt wire. Generally it will be between the alternator output terminal and the starter relay battery terminal. There will be one M meter wire connected to the starter relay and another connected to the alternator output terminal that goes to the M meter. The connections for the two M meter wires may be made in the harnesses, so they may be hard to find without untapping the harness. Notice also the wires that run to the M meter have some connectors in them, like the bulkhead connectors. If any connections are corroded, it can cause erratic operation of the M meter. Slide 7. For you electrical nerds, I have included the electrical information in this and subsequent slides. The important thing to get from this information is for a 1966 Mustang the M meter will have an approximately range of 100 amps. This slide shows the current flow arrows without the alternator charging. This condition will occur if the key is in the run position with the engine not running or if the alternator has failed. This will cause the M meter pointer move toward the D or discharge. It will be more apparent if you turn on your headlights and run the heater blower to increase the current draw from the battery. Slide 8. This slide shows the current flow arrows with the alternator charging. This will be when the engine is running and the alternator is charging. Notice the current flow through the M meter is reversed from the not charging slide. This will cause the M meter pointer move toward the C or charge. Hopefully this video will assist you in troubleshooting your gauge systems.